In the late 19th and early 20th century Atlantic world, a period historians call the Progressive Era, the costs of industrial and human waste became too great even for the most well-off to ignore. So what had originally been private profit-seeking service, sanitation, became public services which greatly increased the livability of cities. This video explores that episode in progressivism. Despite the enormous expansion of the U.S. economy in the second half of the 19th century, poverty was not only pervasive, but by typical measures, well-being was worsening. Average height and life expectancy fell after the Civil War because of adulterated food, backbreaking labor, and hazardous working conditions. Scarce housing caused overcrowding. In Chicago, horses, mules, and cows produced more than 600,000 tons of manure a year. In New York, scavengers had to remove 15,000 dead horses in 1880 alone. For many cities, it was common to dump garbage on vacant lots or near the least desirable neighborhoods. Pigs roamed freely, slaughterhouses spewed noxious fumes, and vermin infested dwellings. The city was an environment for private money making, and its government was to encourage private business. Sewage, garbage collection, and water were private services run for profit and generally only available to the native-born and well-off. Immigrant and black neighborhoods usually relied on polluted wells for their water. Native-born Americans blamed immigrants and black people rather than affluent whites for piles of garbage and rubbish, even though, according to a 1912 survey in Chicago, native-born whites produced substantially more waste than immigrants. In fact, a single downtown hotel could produce more garbage than entire poor neighborhoods. How do sanitary services go from a private service for the well-off to a public service for everyone? Part of the answer is that the diseases from poor sanitation could not be contained to the poorer parts of town. After all, domestic servants, nannies, and construction workers could bring diseases from their neighborhoods to more upscale neighborhoods. In 1878, the city of Memphis, Tennessee was hit with a yellow fever epidemic which killed 12% of their population. Though the rich usually blamed epidemics on the poor, on immigrants, on black folk, and on the disabled, of the 5,000 deaths Memphis suffered, only 946 came from the colored population. In the aftermath of this epidemic, Memphis constructed a sewage system. Other cities followed suit. The number of communities with some form of sewer system increased from 100 in 1870 to 3,000 by 1920. In the first two decades of the 20th century, American public health spending increased tenfold. By contrast, assistance to the poor only rose 50% in that time period. The fact that diseases killed poor and rich alike is insufficient to explain the sanitary revolution. After all, Americans have always rejected evidence which contradicts their firmly held racial and class stereotypes with tenaciously anti-empirical and anti-intellectual passion. Blaming victims is an American pastime. But industrialization created a new type of worker whose identity was based on deep, technical expertise. These were scientists, engineers, lawyers, doctors, and economists. They saw the afflictions of modern society as technical problems rather than as cultural or individual failures, and they sought to apply scientific and technical knowledge to urban dysfunction. Medical historians have argued that a critical disjuncture in public health came after 1880 when the germ theory of disease, which attributed illness to microscopic organisms such as bacteria and viruses, replaced the miasma theory of disease, which blamed epidemics on bad-smelling air. Miasma was easily correlated with the supposedly poor hygiene of the poor, lending itself to moralization of disease. The reality, however, is complicated. Doctors did increasingly subscribe to germ theory, but most still believe that disease was as much environmental as pathogenic, and the quest to clean up sources of bacteria and viruses, such as standing sewage and garbage, dovetailed with the conviction that getting rid of bad spells improved healthfulness. The results, regardless, were tremendous. For example, the death rate from waterborne illnesses plummeted 88%. In a lot of cities, public health drives provoked conflicts with private companies. Landlords of the poor were unwilling to make connections to underground sewers, and often property owners opposed public sanitation because it meant higher taxes. Property owner associations denounced public health as socialism and taxes as theft. They reiterated that disease and squalor were caused by the immoral and unsavory hygiene of the poor. Across the pond in Great Britain, anti-municipalization took the form of organizations such as the Association for the Protection of Property Owners, 
the Middle Class Defense Association, and the Liberty and Property Defense League. In the early 20th century, two forms of capitalist ideology predominated. We could say the marketplace of ideas produced an oligopoly of thought. Popular among older academics, the courts, philosophers, and bourgeois newspaper editors was laissez-faire. Laissez-faire devolved responsibility for economic welfare from politics to markets. It says that we are all driven by self-interest, that society is best when each person is allowed to act in his own self-interest, that markets should be free, and that the invisible hand of the market is governed by universal natural law. Furthermore, Attempts to ameliorate the inequalities of modern society through government policies usually only makes things worse. If things are bad, it is usually best to let the market sort it out. As famous British philosopher of liberty John Stuart Mill wrote, laissez-faire should be the general practice. Every departure from it, unless required by some great good, is a certain evil. The doctrine of laissez-faire was most infamously put to the test in 1870s India, where Viceroy of India, Lord Lytton, refused to intervene in a horrendous famine because he followed the teachings of economic philosopher Adam Smith, who wrote in The Wealth of Nations that famine has never arisen from any other cause but the violence of governments attempting, by improper means, to remedy the inconvenience of dearth. As six to ten million Indians starved to death, grain merchants exported a record 640 million pounds of wheat from India to Europe. Many capitalists and bankers, most famously financial titan J.P. Morgan, rejected classical liberalism in favor of concentration and coordination. With so much capital invested in large operations such as railroads and industrial factories, unfettered competition threatened bankruptcy and economic busts by constantly driving prices below the minimum level necessary to recoup massive investments. So they believe capitalists should work together to keep prices stable and essentially plan the economy. Along those lines, J.P. Morgan coordinated dozens of major mergers in the late 19th century. Where these ideologies converged was on the idea that capitalists acting in their own self-interest was best for society as a whole. They also asserted that natural law governed the economy and capitalists were merely servants of those laws. Both virulently opposed labor unions and government interventions in the economy that were not at the behest of capitalists. Progressives rejected this blatant naturalization of capitalist self-interest. Of particular importance was the development of alternative ideas about political economy in the 1880s, when American graduate students learned at German universities about historical economics. Whereas neoclassical economics posits that there are universal laws which bind all societies, the German historical school contended that economies evolve according to their particular historical, political, and social institutions. The founder of the German Economic Association, Gustav von Schmoller, said that we need to think historically, contextually, and empirically about economic policy. For example, German historicists noted that countries such as Great Britain and the United States had protected their domestic industries and only shifted towards laissez-faire when their economies achieved competitive advantages over competitors. In 1885, economists steeped in the German historical school founded the American Economic Association, the opening line of the American Economic Association was that we regard the state as an agency whose positive assistance is one of the indispensable conditions of human progress. What is interesting is that many of this younger generation of economists called themselves socialists. Now, they were not socialists in the market sense, nor were they even socialists in the sense of Eugene Debs. Just as Bernie Sanders supporters, most of whom are more New Deal liberals and social democrats than socialists, adopt the label of democratic socialism as a counter to the pervasive influence of neoliberalism in both democratic and republican politics. To many progressives of the late 19th and early 20th century, socialism served as an antonym against competitive individualism. It meant that rather than the state being considered an extraneous, intervening, and exogenous force, the state could be a means to solve the problems created by industrial capitalism. And like the Bernie Sanders wing of the modern progressive movement, early 20th century progressives idolized Europe. They modeled sanitary reforms after British municipal efforts, which stemmed from sanitary investigations spearheaded by Edwin Chadwick in the 1840s, which showed that urban disease was caused by ecological factors such as polluted wells, standing sewage, and the airless warrens of inner courtyards. Propelled by sanitation science, cholera epidemics, 
and the fear that slums were morally contagious, British political authorities more tightly regulated the private city. They also constructed systems of reservoirs, aqueducts, mains, and filtration plants, and by 1905, Birmingham's public water system had twice the capitalization as the average of Britain's 50 largest industrial firms. A lot of different groups came together to produce a movement for universal sanitation. Voluntary citizens associations, reform clubs, and civic organizations formed environmental pressure groups. Women in particular spearheaded public sanitation, and they organized groups such as the Ladies' Health Protective Association. Since men's clubs viewed the city as an arena for business, men tended to support contracting out sanitation services to private companies. Private companies, in turn, cut costs by employing poorly trained workers and only cleaning main thoroughfares. Women, on the other hand, viewed cities as places where they had to live and to raise children, so they cared more about improving the healthfulness of cities than on profits. They pushed for municipalization of sanitation services over the contract system. Between 1880 and 1924, the proportion of cities with municipal garbage collection increased from 24% to 63%. The antitrust movement inspired by the populist movement also played a role. Though the populist movement was defeated in the 1890s, populist language and ideas still permeated public discourse. The fear that giant concentrations of capital, broadly referred to as trusts, threatened democracy and economic fairness, haunted Americans of all walks of life. They worried that capitalists could bribe politicians, crush unions, and stifle consumption by directing revenues from wages to profits. The fact that sanitation services provided by private companies cost on average 40% more than those provided by municipal works reinforced the notion that trusts were taking over every aspect of American life and squeezing the public dry. Public outcry against the robber barons and the exploitation of the trust cast a shadow over private water companies, and again, this helped drive municipalization. In 1870, there were 244 public water works. By 1924, there was nearly 10,000. Transatlantically, the specter of radical anarchist and socialist movements incited reforms. The assassination of President William McKinley in 1901 by an ordinary worker attempting to ignite a revolution through an exemplary act of violence against an agent of capital, what anarchists call propaganda of the deed, worried Theodore Roosevelt, who feared that if conditions remained dismal for workers, that if government failed to check capitalist exploitation, violent radicalism would inflame the working class. That is why, shockingly, he compelled mine owners to negotiate with strikers in 1902, signed the Food and Drug Administration Act, and broke up the Northern Securities Trust. German conservatives created the continent's first welfare state to discourage workers from joining socialist parties. In Memphis, the city we started with, the mortality rate fell by half. More broadly, life expectancy began to grow in the 1880s after having fallen in the previous decade. By the 1920s, for the first time in history, cities were healthier than the countryside. This was achieved because Americans realized that not everything should be left up to the market that they in fact lived in a society, and that in a society you could only ignore the needs of the poor, marginalized, and dispossessed for so long before the whole society begins to crumble. Of course, public sector professionals can be co-opted by capital, and their racist classism often biases them against the knowledge that comes from lived experience, especially the lived experience of the poor and racially marginalized. We don't want to copy progressive technocracy, which discourages the kind of democratic engagement that protects public institutions from capitalist capture. But there are some lessons we can glean. One, blaming individuals for social problems and ignoring the needs of minority groups ultimately makes all of society worse off. Two, the most vulnerable better grasp the nature of our problems than capitalists and businessmen. The women who had to raise children in the city knew better than the men who just saw the city as an arena for making money. Today, reform is big business, and in areas from education to poverty reduction, reform-peddling huckster entrepreneurs are legion. We should tell them to shut up. Three, we should listen to actual experts, people whose credibility derives from their credentials rather than their connection to capital. A community is not a business, but formal expertise should not trump the lived experience of those most affected. People don't want saviors. They want the means to lift themselves and their communities up. Four, efficient private enterprise is a myth. 
markets meet the demands of people with money, and capitalists export costs of production to the poorest and most vulnerable. For all the flaws and corruption in progressive era municipal services, they still manage to provide more comprehensive coverage at lower cost than private contractors. Thank you very much for watching this video. If it is no great inconvenience, please remember to comment, press the like button, and subscribe.